Hey everybody, welcome back to Chapter 5, Part 2. Our key terms this time around include extinction, spontaneous recovery, generalization, discrimination, and lastly, the sad and truly infamous case of Little Albert. Well, let's get back to the condition stimulus from Part 1. How does it acquire its power to make the dog salivate? What's, what's going on here? As organisms, you and I have a need to predict the future. Pavlov discovered that if the bell is sounded shortly before the unconditioned stimulus of food, it predicts and signals the occurrence of food, and that's useful to know. The body begins to salivate as if it's been given a heads up that food is on the way. You would not get the same effect if the bell was rung after the presentation of food because it doesn't predict anything then. And back to the condition response. A salivation response to meat is an unconditioned response because it was not taught. It is a reflex. The salivation response to the bell is a conditioned response. It may look like a reflex on the outside, but it was learned. This difference between the unconditioned response and the conditioned response can be confusing. It is a hard principle to grasp. But I want you to think of the word condition. What does it mean if you condition something? It means you treat it differently to get a different response. If you condition your body, this means by exercise and working out, it begins to respond differently. So if you'll think of a condition response as something that's been treated and something learned, I think that may be helpful. Pavlov could ring the bell after conditioning and get a condition response, a salivation, for just a few trials. Do you think the dogs would continue to salivate if we keep ringing the bell but never pair it again with food? No. Why is this? Well, the bell no longer signals the unconditioned stimulus of food. And so the conditioned response gradually weakens. It extinguishes out and eventually disappears. And we call this extinction. And we define it as the weakening and eventual disappearance of the CR. It is as if the dog is saying, <clears throat> there's no point in salivating anymore because you're not giving me any more food. Pavlov discovered, however, that if he did not work with his dogs for a few weeks and then brought them back into the lab and presented the CS, something unexpected happened. What do you think happened? That's right. The condition response reappears and we get some salivation. And this is called spontaneous recovery. And it suggests that the extinction does not completely eliminate the effects of prior conditioning. The spontaneous recovery that, that we do get, however, it will extinguish very quickly if there is no further pairing of the bell with the food. After the condition response has been extinguished, you've gone through spontaneous recovery, and then completely extinguishes, do you think we can ever bring the, the CR back? Yeah, we can do that. We simply put the animal through another acquisition. Phase will repair the conditioned stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. The dog learns even faster the second time around, by the way. And for all the conscious frustration that the dog may have felt over extinction, Classical conditioning still occurs in the brain at an unconscious level that we have very little control over. And that is why we could theoretically alternate between acquisition and extinction for a long time. Pavlov and other experiments would condition dogs to salivate to middle C on a piano, like this one here. He would then play a B or a D, which are each one tone away from C. What do you think would happen? The dog will salivate. He explained it as stimulus generalization. 
the tendency to make a CR to a stimulus that is similar in the ballpark to the original CS. Pavlov would continue acquisition training to middle C, but never pair food with the tone B or D. This is called discrimination or discrimination training, defined as a learned ability to distinguish between similar stimuli so that the conditioned response only occurs to the original condition stimulus, but not to similar stimuli. Well, you might be thinking about now that this is all fine for dogs, but what does this have to do with me? It turns out classical conditioning can help you and I understand a great deal about our emotions, especially if we have no idea where they came from. This brings up the issue how do phobias develop. Back in the early 1900s, most psychologists would explain fears and phobias are inherited, kind of like an instinct. John Watson was a psychologist who had studied Pavlov's work, and he said, I don't think so. I don't think so. He believed that a lot of our behavior and emotions was classically conditioned, and he set out to demonstrate this with an 11-month-old infant forever known as Little Albert. Albert showed no fear when he was presented with stimuli, including a burning fire, a dog or a monkey, and a little white lab rat, all of which would have been expected to cause some apprehension. Albert, in particular, enjoy playing with the white lab rat. He did, however, exhibit a normal USUR reflex in response to a loud banging sound that caused him to cry. Watson then did several conditioning trials where he presented the white lab rat to Albert a moment before hammering a large metal bar positioned a few feet behind the child. He repeated this several times over a couple of weeks. Then he presented the rat by itself with no banging. And what do you think happens? Albert cries. He falls over. He tries to crawl away. What is the U.S. in this research? Think about that. It would be the loud metal banging, wouldn't it? What was the UR in this research? Well, that's the emotional distress. What was the CS in this research? The little white lab rat. And what was the CR in this research? Well, that would be the emotional distress. <clears throat> Little Albert and his mother moved out of town shortly afterward, and Watson is vilified to this day for teaching Little Albert to fear a harmless white lab rat without any attempt to cure him of his phobia. No one could do this type of research today. We have ethical principles in place to prevent it. If I tried to do this, Child Protective Services would be called, as they should be, and I would be under investigation. Well, <clears throat> that concludes the main points on classical conditioning. But, <clears throat> is there more to human learning than simply responding to a stimulus? Absolutely. Join us next time on Part 3. See you then. Bye-bye.